Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Hi, I'm Michael Duncan, and welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focused on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each of our guests. Our goal is to help the listeners learn how they can achieve their own financial freedom through the experience and stories of experts that have done just that. Today's guest is an experienced serial entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Percent, the modern credit marketplace. He was first inspired to transform and modernize the private credit industry after working at several global financial institutions where he witnessed multiple inefficiencies. Wanting to address the lack of standardization, lack of transparency, and limited access to private credit, he founded Percent in 2018 and has been working to innovate the space since then. I am very excited to welcome Nelson Chu to the show. Nelson, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Yeah, I, I'm, I got to be honest, I'm pretty excited just to learn about, you know, what you guys do at Percent, what Percent is. Obviously, you know, I have a bit of an understanding, but um, we made a connection through someone else in our company, Camaplan, and uh, I was really excited because it sounds like you guys are doing something really different over there. We are indeed. Yeah, it's uh, we're focusing on a segment of the market that not many people actually know about. They probably interact with it in some way, shape or form. Uh, but the beauty of it is you can actually invest in it as well and get returns in this market that are pretty uncorrelated uh, to what's going on in the equity markets and just the broader macro environment today. So before we even go back and kind of get into your history a little bit, can you just tell me about percent? Can you tell me what area of the market it is and, you know, why you thought it made sense to kind of, you know, find this untapped area? Absolutely. Uh, percent has built the modern credit marketplace and we focus specifically on private credit. So for those of you who don't know, private credit is an asset class that, like I mentioned, you know, it goes a little bit under the radar. It's been around for decades, uh, but it really didn't come into kind of the spotlight until after the global financial crisis. So let's rewind a little bit back to like 07, 08. Banks before then were doing a lot of different lending, right? Lending to small businesses, lending to consumers. And then ever since the financial crisis, regulators stepped in. They said, oh, you can't do that anymore, right? And so they made it very expensive to be able to do that type of lending. Now, fast forward a few years, huge gap in the market, huge void that needs to be filled with consumers and businesses needing debt and loans. And so you had a lot of non-bank lenders stepping in to be able to fill that gap. And so that's how you know a lot of student loans came about, like SoFi. You had a lot of buy now, pay laters in recent years. Those are all private debt lenders, essentially, that have essentially filled that gap that the banks have left behind. But the difference between a private debt lender and a bank lender is that banks have deposits, right? So they can use the deposits to lend against. And as long as they earn more in interest than they do in terms of it costing them uh, from an actual balance sheet standpoint that they pay out, they make money. Non-banks and these private debt lenders don't have a balance sheet. So they have to raise money from elsewhere. And that elsewhere is where they could do it on percent, essentially. So we give investors the opportunity to invest in and earn a return in these private debt uh, loan portfolios from these various different lenders that are in the ecosystem. That sounds very interesting. And I guess the the first question I'd have is, you know, why wasn't that much of a thing beforehand? Was it simply just because of the way that these debts were handled prior to that financial crisis? Yeah, I think banks just dominated the market, right? So if a bank itself has the cheapest cost of capital, nobody can beat deposits, right? Because deposits, yeah. you earn like no interest. Like Right now is a little bit of an anomaly. Normally, there's no interest you have to pay out on that, or it's very, very low. Even more before the financial crisis, you know, you had like banks paying out a couple of percentage points. It was fine, but they could use that and essentially use those deposits to invest and lend out to various different places that were earning significantly more. So nothing beats having your own balance sheet to lend against. Ever since the regulators stepped in, made it very expensive, then it actually made sense for a non-bank lender to be able to come in and get a spread against whatever it costs them and whatever they can charge. And so all of that kind of came to fruition. And you're seeing it even more so now with all these recent banking crises, 
Regulators are going to step in again. They like to do that whenever banks do you know, bad things. Yeah. Uh, and that has made private credit come to the forefront even further. And so you're seeing the likes of Apollo and KKR and Blackstone, the smart money, if you will, come in and double down on private credit because they're seeing that opportunity and that arbitrage there that just wasn't even there before a few years or a few months back. So if I am someone that is looking to invest in this realm, I guess my question would be why with percent, why with you guys? And, you know, what are you doing differently? Yeah, for sure. So private credit actually historically is pretty inaccessible in the grand scheme of things, uh, even for like investing in KKR's private credit fund or Blackstone's private credit fund. The minimums are super high. So it's like call it a quarter of a million, something like that at a minimum, if not more than that. And so that actually isn't really approachable for the average investor. And also the lockups sometimes are for a very, very long time. And so our thinking here was, let's do something a little bit differently. Let's do something that's much more investor friendly, if you will. And we created products that are significantly shorter duration structurally, right? Like they're naturally going to be, call it three years or, or anywhere from nine months to three years, but they have various different things built in so you can get your money out if you want within like a two to three month time frame. Also, the minimum is not $250,000. It's going to be like $500 oftentimes in our in our products. And that in of itself means that you can actually try it and learn about private credit and experience it before you say, oh, the $500 investment did fine. I want to put a little more in, put a little more in. And then it ultimately helps you build a portfolio that's actually diversified across private credit to supplement and complement everything you have in the rest of your portfolio, whether it's equities, real estate, you name it. Um, so we've made it the most approachable, the most uh, accessible market and paired with a lot of the things you mentioned in the intro, which I appreciate the intro, couldn't have done it better myself, uh, around the transparency side of things, right? Being able to actually help you truly understand how your investment is performing. Private credit historically has been very opaque. You can sometimes get a statement every month or every quarter, but you really have no idea how to read it to understand how what you invested in is actually doing outside of the return that you get in terms of interest. So our ability to provide that level of transparency with underlying asset performance, seeing like, oh, I invested in this lender. I can see how every single loan in that portfolio is doing. I can see whether it's performing as it's expected in the uh, subscription agreement that I signed, or it's actually not doing, in which case we got a problem, right? That happens on a weekly basis with us. That is an unprecedented level of transparency, frequency, all of that, that we've made available to regular accredited investors, which is just normally very, very difficult to do. So are the investors able to... I'm assuming they're able to kind of see and understand what exactly they're investing in in terms of, you know, who they're allowing, who they're giving credit or loans to. Are they able to choose or is that something that you guys kind of curate for them? No, we do both. That's kind of the beauty of it. So there will always be an opportunity to invest directly, right? We've had a lot of investors say, well, you know what? I tend to prefer international opportunities, especially in emerging markets, because I feel like I'm doing good for the world while also, you know, earning a return. Uh, you have some people that say I only want like small business because I feel small business in this environment is safer than consumer. Uh, we had COVID times where you know nobody wanted to invest in a small business lender, and that had a very different, uh, different yeah. um, vibe at the time at this at that point in time, right? <laughs> so that opportunity and ability to be, um, I think. Uh, selective in what you choose and what you want to invest in will always be there. Now, that's not always the most fun thing to do because you have to be very discerning. You have to keep managing it. And the more, you know, I think the more you have other stuff going on in your life, this becomes less important or less interesting to do. And you want to kind of get almost like a diversified basket, right? So we also offer what's called a blended note. And a blended note has essentially themes to them. So it could be like US only, it could be senior positions only, it could be high yield only, it could be short term only, you name it. And you can invest in every single deal that meets that criteria, gets automatically allocated to it. And so you end up getting a basket of diversified private credit exposure across different managers, across different borrowers, across different deals. That becomes very attractive. And we've seen investors do both, right? This, this part of their portfolio is diversified, set and forget it. And this one is like a little bit of extra alpha they want on their own by managing it themselves. So similar to the way you can do it with an ETF and regular stocks and bonds or regular stocks that you can pick, you can do it here for private credit as well, that we make that available. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the first thing that came to mind as you were kind of, you know, going through that with me was it sounds very similar to just your typical retirement fund in a lot of ways, you, you know, not, you know, not doing alternative investments, but just doing stocks and whatnot, how I don't have to necessarily know anything. I can kind of put my money with someone who knows a lot more than me, thankfully. Um, and, you know, maybe I have certain preferences or whatever, but it sounds like this, it can be a good opportunity for both 
people like me that don't know a ton necessarily about what exactly they want to invest in, but also the really veteran type of investor that knows exactly what they want to do, why they want to do it, and it still provides a good opportunity for them. Exactly. And we've had very sophisticated, regular accredited investors on the platform who we've tried to say, you know, you invest in like 50 things. You should probably just go into a blend note. They're like, no, I actually vet every single one of these opportunities. And these are the 50 that I like. So I was like, okay, that's fine by me. All the power to you. I'm glad we give you that option, but it's a lot of work. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, over here at Camo Plan, we deal with a lot of, uh, I mean, we deal with entirely uh, retirement funds and you know, investing uh, with your self-directed IRAs, 401ks, all that kind of stuff. And we run into a lot of that where we're not actually allowed to, you know, suggest or recommend. And it just turns out that people have to do their own due diligence. And that seems like a really interesting kind of mix of opportunities with you guys where, again, you're doing the due diligence for them a lot of the times for people that just want to be able to kind of set it and forget it, but are sick and tired of doing the stocks and stuff, you know, especially with the way that the world has been recently, you know. Exactly. And we've seen that too as well, right? Like private credit, unlike public market fixed income, uh, is much more reactive to current market conditions. So public credit, oftentimes, a lot of these maturities are like 20, 30 years. A lot of those issuers just aren't going to come out to market because they're sitting on really, really low yield right? or yeah. low cost of capital. And so they'll just wait this whole thing out until it finally comes back down, rates drop from the Fed, and they'll can go back out to market again. Private credit, because we talked about the duration is very short, oftentimes under nine months, under three months, you're seeing the rates react. And so what was originally 10% is now 12%. What was 12 is now 14. What is 14 is now 17. And so you actually do still get good risk-adjusted returns relative to what you can get in a you know money market account or something like that. There's going to be a good 12, 13% spread against your money market account uh, that you're just not going to find really anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like an incredible just you know, different kind of opportunity, which is exactly what uh, you want it to be. So um, I do want to kind of go back a little bit now. I want to talk about, you know, how you got here. And uh, I mean, like you said, like this is kind of a niche. This is something that was untapped. And um, I would love to explore, I guess, how you found that it was untapped or how you decided to make this decision to found a company. Um, so could sure. you just take me back to the beginning, wherever that may be. Yeah, well, we're going to get to when I was born. Uh, so in many ways, I feel like I always I was always destined to be an entrepreneur, if only for the fact that I was an incredibly rebellious child. I didn't listen to anything my parents said. Uh, so I grew up in suburban New Jersey, you know, middle class upbringing, nothing too crazy. Mom was super traditional. And so she thought if you go to an Ivy League school, you get to become a doctor, lawyer, or banker, you're gonna be set for life. And my dad was the polar opposite. And so they didn't always see eye to eye on how to raise me. Uh, but I turned out okay, I think, at least. Uh, so my dad was an entrepreneur in his own right. He had actually co-founded a uh, software company with a bunch of his friends in the airline crew optimization space. And so very, very specific. Uh, but yes. back in the day, call it in the 90s, uh, if you flew on any airline, they actually scheduled the flight attendants and the pilots on that flight with a massive whiteboard and a bunch of index cards at the beginning of the month, which of doesn't sound very scalable. And Southwest probably still operates like that today. Uh, but regardless, they created software to be able to basically say, okay, sometimes you want to maximize seniority. Sometimes you want to maximize preferences. What a novel concept. You have to make sure you adhere to union laws. Anyway, so they created software. Uh, it's like a decently sized market. They got a good chunk of it. But he was always very encouraging of me to kind of try new things, right? That weren't always academic. And so he bought me a Mac in 1999 before it was cool because nobody really had a Mac in 1999. I taught myself Photoshop, taught myself movie making. He let me modify the crap out of my car. Like it was all a whole thing, right? Wow, totally okay, not academic. Yeah. Um, and I was able to flex a lot of the other side of my brain that I just always never really had the chance to do. So fast forward to high school, finishing high school, you kind of have to go to college. Did not go to an Ivy League school. Mom was super disappointed, uh, but ended up finishing in three years because I was so done with academics with a double major and a minor in econ, poli sci, and philosophy. I can None see of which why is she'd be disappointed. <laughs> None of which is useful today outside of philosophy, maybe. And that's a big maybe. Uh, before graduating in 2009 interesting time to be joining the workforce. I, uh, I ended up joining uh, Merrill Lynch, or what once was Merrill Lynch. Uh, I have the badge of honor of being the last summer analyst class at Merrill Lynch before it became Bank of America. Wasn't sure if I still had a job after that, uh, because Bank of America was very wishy-washy as to whether they were going to keep the offers open, uh, but they did, thankfully. And I joined the wealth management side of the business, doing business intelligence. It was fine. A lot of Excel, a lot of like macros and all that stuff. Didn't really learn a whole lot about finance. It was fine. Uh, and then after a year and a half of Bank of America, uh, I got a lot of people whispering my ear saying, oh, you got to join the buy side. Buy side's better than the sell side. So I was like, 
Okay, fine. If buy side is better than sell side, I'll join the largest buy side shop on the street, BlackRock. And then after two months, I was just like, I uh, buy side is not better than sell side. As a matter of fact, every side is just not good. And so I'm just going to leave altogether. And so I, I stuck it out for a year at BlackRock because you're not supposed to leave that quickly. And then after that, I decided to try and do my own thing. So 2012, 2013, New York tech ecosystem was kind of taking off at the time. Uh, people were showing up at meetups and things like that. And it was actually super cool. So I thought to myself, how hard could it be to build a company? And I realized within a couple months how hard it was to build a company. And so I had attempted to do a startup, failed spectacularly, burned through all the cash I had saved up, burned through whatever my parents had contributed to help me along my way. And I think you do your best work when your back is against the wall and you're absolutely broke. And so um, ended up launching out of the ashes of that startup, a consulting company that helped other founders build their companies from the ground up, uh, learning from all my mistakes and also leveraging a little bit of my finance background. Uh, so we provided product, marketing, branding, engineering expertise, had a couple of unicorns as clients, and they all happened to be in the fintech space. And so, you know, I think a lot of companies just saw my finance background. I could do a PL, I could do financial modeling. They were just like, oh, you understand my business so well. So I was like, okay, fine. So we're going to stick with fintech. Uh, and, and at that point, having done it for about four or five years, I was just thinking to myself, man, like selling services is not the most fun thing to do in the world. Um, and I'm not doing any of the fun stuff. I'm actually just doing a lot of sales. And so if there is a good idea, right idea, right time, uh, if we can leverage a team that we have that knows how to build companies, and if we can leverage our VC network, we should do things the old-fashioned venture-backed way. And that's really how Percent came to be. So back in 2017, 2018, because I had a lot of fintech clients, we were surveying the landscape of sort of what was interesting out there. And alternative investments definitely was interesting, right? But you had a lot of stuff in asset classes that were already kind of pretty well spoken for. So equity, like startup equity, you got mm -hmm. Angelus, you got Republic, you got all that stuff. You got real estate, right? There was like no shortage of real estate crowdfunding platforms out there. And you had kind of the generalist ones that do a little bit of everything. But private credit was the one that we thought had a really good opportunity for investors, for retail credit investors specifically, because it was very predictable. Every single month, as long as it does what it's supposed to do, it should pay you interest. It's not like this totally crazy thing out there that just pays whenever it wants to pay. Uh, it had you know, the ability to actually create shorter duration products. Uh, other platforms were super long duration, four to five years. So if I can create a one month product, two month product, it's gonna be pretty attractive. And then the minimums could be low under certain regulations and guidelines. And so we were able to offer $500 minimums and we were all yielding kind of the nine to 16% range. So all those factored together, we thought there's a really interesting opportunity here to do things a little bit differently, a little bit better than what's out there in the market. And that's how really percent came to be. And we've evolved it ever since then into sort of what it is today, which is also both a marketplace as well as an infrastructure solution uh, for a very, very disjointed fragmented market. Wow. So first of all, I can tell you've rehearsed that because you have first time I've ever said it. Now you have that down to a science. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, you have me the whole way. I was, I was, I was ready to watch a movie on that story. Whatever, <laughs> wherever the heck it was going, I was ready. Um, I do. Before we get back to present, I, I am curious. What was the failed company? Everyone always asks me that. All right. Well, so you, here we you go. make a big deal out of it. I know. You don't I mention, know. So. I gotta tell it. All right. So. Back in 2012, 2013, um, there was a lot of hype around social news. And so I was actually always interested in reading the news. Uh, but my thinking was, you know, people are so stuck on social media these days. They're actually not reading good content. They're reading like very uh, trashy is not the right word, but like lowbrow content, I think is the way to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so things like The Economist and The Atlantic and all these like, you know, um, highbrow pieces are just not really getting the readership they used to. So the theory was if we could crowdsource what everyone was sharing on social media around like pieces of the article and things like that, then you can actually highlight the key points of the article without having to read the whole thing. So you could read the language of The Economist without reading the whole like 20 page thing. Um, that all sounds great, except if you're going to do crowdsourcing, you need to have a crowd. And I didn't really have a crowd because I had no users. And so that inevitably will fall on its face. Uh, and that's sort of where after six months, I realized that, you know, I picked up a little bit of sales skills, picked up a little bit of design skills, picked up a little bit of product management, but I had no idea what I was doing. And so that was sort of what uh, taught me a lot at the very least about what not to do. And then helping founders also not make the same mistakes I did along the way. I mean, honestly, it sounds like a it sounds like you were almost maybe too early on the idea. Maybe that's just like seeing how social media has evolved. I, I mean, you know, I, I grew up with it. I watched it grow in so yeah. many ways. It was so involved in my life. Um, I graduated high school in 2014. So like 
I don't know. That's it. Sorry. That's just that interests me. That's a very cool it's, concept. It's a cool idea. It just sounds yeah. like maybe even five years later when I feel like Twitter especially is very news centric in a lot of ways for a lot of people. Um, you know, maybe that would have. I, I thought it was doing something good for the world too, right? Because like you do want people to read, you know, yeah. higher level language and like yeah. higher level written English. Um, and so I thought it'd be very helpful. Uh, but I think, you know, media is hard. Like uh, yeah. outside of the flagship, like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, those guys, you look at, we're recording this at the end of June. Uh, you look at what happened to Vice, what happened to BuzzFeed. Like it's very telling about sort of how yeah. difficult it is to build a media company. Um, so yeah. fortunately, I think I'm, I'm out of it and in, Capital markets, fintech, which always seems to know how to make money. So I'll I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, at the very least, you're definitely somewhere that uh, is at least a tad safer. I mean, media companies as a whole, it feels like they've not come and gone, but like they've already sort of hit their peak. Like you mentioned, with BuzzFeed is a great name to mention for that. Um, it's interesting how quickly there was, you know, a hundred of them. YouTube started to get privatized with companies like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're just slowly kind of fading away. It's very interesting. And a very they're they're all going to blame facebook for changing their algorithm but probably yep. but yes yeah yep no but a very intriguing topic regardless um but you know something that i normally like to talk about on this podcast regardless and you actually brought up is uh, i love seeing how people learn from their failures i'm a big believer in the idea that you learn more from failing than you do from succeeding most of the time um so i'm curious like what did you learn from those failures in particular that helped you you know obviously with your consulting company and helping other companies avoid the mistakes that you made but also in the form in the formation of percent outside of you know not doing a media company yeah absolutely so look the consulting company did fine right it was like it peaked at around 15 people uh most of them were contractors because it's hard to keep people on full time in that instance mm -hmm. if you don't have guaranteed uh, business essentially uh, and we topped out at close to about a million in revenue uh, when all was said and done in our best year. It was fine, right? Nice little lifestyle business. Um, but the, the difference is it taught me so much about what to do. And it taught me so much about how to build a company. Um, and I think in many ways, uh, the, a successful startup comes down to the team that you have, the ability and willingness to be nimble, a lot of luck along the way, and also making less mistakes. And all those things together make for a good recipe that I just at least somewhat ensures your survival. Because in many instances for a startup, if you can survive long enough, you're going to make it in some way, shape or form. Uh, so on the consulting side, first time being on my own, right? First time yeah. running a company, first time managing a team. And I made so many mistakes along the way, like between the incorporation side of things and not listening to my dad about drafting solid legal agreements to how to charge clients to how to manage a culture, which I didn't really care about the time. I was like, I'm paying you. How much, you know, how much more do you need? Like this is work. And before realizing that, yeah, like the team that you have here today is going to make or break what happens here. Yep. And they have to be bought into the mission, the vision and all of that. And so it was a learning exercise for me in all the different ways I've tripped up in that consulting side to not make the same mistakes here at Percent. And I've been very fortunate. I think we've been very fortunate as a company that we just haven't made a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, and, you know, I, I was, I credit the consulting company in teaching me to be even more of a generalist than I ever was before. So when we first started Percent, I was the only designer because I ran, you know, an agency that knew how to do design, right? And I was yeah. subbing in for our designers every once in a while. Uh, we knew how to do marketing uh, because we gave guidance on that and we knew how to hire the right people uh, for that to be able to help us build up an email list, right? All all these things are things that matter uh, in the in the little things that just if you haven't done it before will take a ton of time for you to learn and get a crash course in that starting percent at 29 years old like I had I had about five six years of experience on that in knowing what to do and what not to do uh, that just helped us get off the ground significantly faster with a team that had worked together before and that made all the difference um, so yeah it, it's hard to, I I would say probably the biggest change that I made between the consulting company and percent was around the culture side of things. Uh, because when you have a services based business, you actually hire many times for like urgent need and mm -hmm. not the potential what they can become because that requires yeah. a lot of training, a lot of oversight, mentorship, things like that, right? And so naturally, if you hire for need, then you hire people that tend to be a little more junior. And a lot of them graduated fresh out of college. Right? So they actually had no work experience. And so it required a lot more micromanagement on my side and culture was almost like on the back burner. And then when we got to percent, you hire, we have VC capital, you hire potential, you hire people that have tremendous upside. 
and the designers at, at my consulting company had upside as well. And many of them are still here with us today, but it takes years to kind of develop that, right? You can't mm-hmm. just get a fresh out of school. Um, so we are able to, it required me to focus on how do you build a winning culture at a company that is transparent, that is motivational, that delivers uh, on what people expect when you promise it. And also fosters one where they believe in the future of the company, the vision. That's why they're bought into it. That is something that would never, ever occur to me before. And it was a lot of like little mini missteps along the way, learning how to do that because it doesn't come naturally to me uh, before we have a company here that has some of the highest retention rates in the industry from employee standpoint, incredible employee satisfaction, always like best places to work. That's awards aren't everything, but it is very telling for the amount of effort we put into it. It feels nice to have that be recognized. It's funny, you know, I, I don't know if you're into sports or not, but um, being from the Philadelphia area, I'm very, very into sports. Uh, and a lot of the things you're saying, you know, about the culture and, um, you know, having people buy in and believe in the future of the company, it, it's not far off from what I hear, you know, NFL head coaches talk about. You know, they're always, it, I feel like I could have copy and pasted that and put it as a, you know, if a head coach said it and it would sound completely normal. And that's just, it's very interesting because I've never, you know, I'm not saying no one ever has talked about it that way. I've just personally never talked to someone that talks about it in that way. And that's interesting. And honestly, I couldn't agree with that, um, that mindset more. I mean, a team is a team is a team, right? Whether you're playing sports, whether you're running a company. So the it's all very, very similar in how you operate and how you inspire people. And honestly, like having belief in something gives you superpowers. Like you yeah. will go to the ends of the earth because you believe in something so fervently. And you have that, if you have that in a company, you will accomplish great things. And that was a learning lesson for me in how to activate that both in myself to be able to deliver that type of message, but also to be able to see the effects of that on the team that we have. It it has made all the difference in the world. And I'm incredibly grateful for the team that we have here because we would not be where we are today without every single ounce of blood, sweat, and tears they put into this over the past five years. My last pop culture reference, I promise. But have you seen Ted Lasso? I have, yes. So again, you said the power, the power of believing. Yeah, no, that that, that popped into my head. Uh, great show. If you haven't seen it, we won't spoil anything here, but definitely worth watching. Uh, not a sponsor, just a great show. <laughs> um, but uh, yes. So speaking of surviving, which was something that you mentioned, how did you guys, you know, you were still relatively new when COVID hit. Um, how did you get through that? How did that affect you? And, you know, what was your mindset as you were kind of going through that? It's interesting. We just segued off of the team, but that one of the key tenets of our culture here is persistence more than anything else. And uh, the reality is, like I mentioned, if you survive long enough, you're going to make something for yourself as a startup, right? And we've been around, we just celebrated a five-year anniversary about a month and a half ago. Um, and it's crazy how time flies. Uh, but we've been hit so many times along the way. Like it's been absolutely crazy. And to be frank, our company, as it existed for the first four years of the company's life, is actually not very VC backable, just in general, uh, because we have a technology company, obviously, which yeah. is what VCs are interested in. We don't have a lot of tech to show for it because we need to run an investment bank to tell the tech team what to build over time. And so VC backed companies don't tend to be investment banks. That's like very, very unusual. And you also burn a ton of cash because running an investment bank is very expensive and running a tech company is also very expensive. So we had a hard time raising capital constantly along the way. It was just a challenge every single time. It granted, it got easier and easier uh, with every single round outside of the most recent round because the markets changed dramatically. Uh, But still, it's it's not that simple, right? So um, we have found... A, in, in ourselves innately, uh, the ability to persist through whatever comes our way, whatever gets thrown our way. And part of it is down to one of the mantras that I've always lived by having got, seen the ups and downs of the consulting company, which is that nothing's really as bad as it seems. Like, you know, you could have lost a client, you could have somebody that just, you know, decide to say, I'm not, I'm not buying whatever you're selling. Uh, but the reality is, you know, it's going to be fine. You still have a team that loves you. You have a company that's still there. Sun will come up tomorrow. It's going to be okay. Don't sweat about it. Right. But also nothing's ever as good as it seems either. You could have had the best meeting in the world. They said they're, we're done deal. It's all good. And then they drop out and you're like, what yeah. the heck? Like, why did they ghost me? And it's okay. Like it happens. Right. So if you stay level headed throughout this process, no problem is too large to surmount be perfectly frank. And that's how we've kind of carried ourselves through. So to your question about like COVID and then like a super hype cycle in the tech 
uh, tech uh, valuations and then a super down cycle in a tech valuation side and over the course of three years, three and a half years, it's been a wild ride, right? For COVID in particular, um, that has a direct impact to private credit, right? So small business lending was a big is a big part of private credit just in general. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants to invest in a small business lender in April 2020. Like it's kind nope. of a little bizarre. So we were fortunate in that we had only been around for nine months at the time. And mm-hmm. so we didn't have a ton of stuff out there. And we were able to navigate and dedicate and double down our efforts on what we had to be able to make sure they survived. And we actually managed to navigate COVID with just one casualty effectively from a borrower standpoint, when we had almost close to a dozen at the time in terms of clients. And that one, there was like no chance, right? We were subordinated yeah. to Aries, like Aries will always do very well for themselves. They're a great firm, but I don't want to be under Aries, I think is the big lesson learned here. Um, but outside of that, you know, we got through it and the market turned very quickly, fortunately, for everybody's benefit, uh, where we were able to kind of pick things back up again. Now, in the hype cycle, it's also important to not get caught in drinking your own Kool-Aid, right? So yeah. there is so much that you could fall victim to, like, we are the best. We are amazing. Everyone else is doing great. This market's going to go up forever. We've always taken a very pragmatic approach to how we raise money, how we fund ourselves, and how we grow. And to that end... Uh, we never raised an evaluation we couldn't live up to, even in the hype cycle times. And it's been almost interesting to see that the valuation that we raised that for our Series A is where Series A valuations have now come down to two, two and a half years later, right? Which is just, you know, I think we were hitting, we I think we hit the fairway on that one in terms yeah. of staying the course. Uh, and then for the Series B that we just closed, which is one of the worst markets for equity fundraising ever on the VC side. Uh, we managed to close that it was oversubscribed. It was an up round in this environment, which is rare. But we can do an up round because our Series A wasn't at a crazy valuation. So that concept of pragmatism and persistence it will will go far, I think, for anybody who is is looking to run, start, or anything like that of a company. No, that seems to make a ton of sense. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I guess I, I would have thought that you know being a relatively new company, only nine months old at the time of COVID, would almost be detrimental. But it sounds like it was more, you know, it was good. It was helpful to you. I would say if we had like, I don't know, $500 million in debt outstanding when nine months into our business, right? And we had the team that we had, we would have been significantly impaired at that point because there was a lot of lenders who are far better staffed than us yeah. uh, who were just trying to scramble to figure out how to navigate this market. Um, so it was a blessing in disguise that we were so young at the time that we yeah. knew how to, we had enough resources to navigate the existing pool of assets and portfolio that we had. Otherwise it would be a very, I don't think you and I would be talking today to be perfectly frank. Cause I'm not sure we'd be around. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. COVID was a, it was a different beast entirely. Something hopefully we don't have to deal with again anytime soon. Yes. But, uh, um, regardless before, uh, I let you, or I ask you to plug all of your website and, uh, all that kind of stuff and let the listeners know where they can find you. Uh, the question I ask everyone that comes onto the show, um, is simply what does financial freedom mean to you? It's a great question. Uh, I think it definitely means something different to everybody. Uh, I think financial freedom, it's choice, it's optionality. It's the ability to not have to think about anything else except for what you want to get out of life, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, the ability for money to almost not be an ob- not be of any object. Actually, it's an interview question I ask every single person in the firm, which is, um, if money no- were no object, what would you be doing with your time? Uh, and uh, I guess I might as well answer my own question. Um, but Please financial do. freedom, if I were to have full financial freedom, unfortunately, I'm sorry to all of our VCs, is not to run a capital markets fintech company in the private credit space. Um, I'm a big like scuba diver. I'm a big like nature lover. And so I would love to open like an animal conservation preserve and just wow. hopefully keep a lot of these animals that are so incredible uh, alive for as long as we possibly can and make sure they don't go extinct. And then also um, as a big diver, I also see what's happening to the coral reefs. I see the fish that are eating microplastics like that we're eating ultimately. And I would love to be able to fund research that solves the microplastics problem, right? Like there's a lot of interesting science happening on that side um, that would be fantastic to work on. So financial freedom means the ability to do things that I'm truly, genuinely passionate about and hopefully be able to make a difference and impact on the world along the way. And maybe and hopefully, fingers crossed, percent will help us get there. So that would be the goal. Wow. Very well said, Nelson. Thank you. 
Um, and now could you please uh, tell the listeners uh, where they can find you, how they can contact you, how they can reach out to you, all that. And the info, again, of course, will be in the description of this episode as well. Yeah, absolutely. Very easy to find. It's We are Percent, so it's just percent.com. Very, very simple. And then uh, our team would love to chat with you if you want to learn more. We have a little chat bot on the bottom right, but also hello at percent.com. Always easy. And if you ever want to talk to me, I'm always happy to chat as well. It's just Nelson at percent.com. Wow. Easy. I like hello. At that. That's funny. I, I feel like you never, I've never heard of a, <laughs> like an introduction email like that. That's that, that I'm going to think about that for like the next week or so. It's very small, but that's something that's going to stick with me. Um, so Nelson, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, you were an absolute pleasure. I feel like I learned a ton about uh, a realm of finance that I really didn't know a lot about. And I'm very much looking forward to following your journey and, you know, hopefully speaking again sometime soon. Absolutely. We'd love to be back. And thanks so much for having me on today. Of course. And uh, as always, thanks for listening to The Road to Financial Freedom. Uh, If you enjoyed the show, please support the podcast by remembering to rate, review, and subscribe. You can keep up to date with us on Facebook or Instagram at Road to Financial Freedom Podcast. Thanks again, and I will see you next time. If you like what you're hearing on The Road to Financial Freedom and want to learn more about self-directed IRAs and 401ks, click the link in the description to download a free toolkit with everything you need to get started.